The views and opinions expressed do not necessarily represent those of Access Fort Wayne, the Allen County Public Library, or any other supporting group. Get involved with Access Fort Wayne and make your own television programming. Call 421-1250 to find out more. Well, the midnight headlights blind you on a rainy night Steep grade up a hill, slow me down, making no time But I gotta keep rolling The windshield wiper, slapping out a tempo Keeping perfect rhythm with the song on the radio But I gotta keep rolling patient's vein. So if you watch this, when I put this roller open, you can see that fluid coming out into the vein, which would go into the patient's arm, into a vein. So then I can stop it, and then it stops. This is a demonstration. Mary, you want to do this? Yeah. So you put it in so that it can drip. It'll, this one won't drip out by itself. You've got to do it very slowly so that for the patient's safety. And this one we have done over 10 seconds. So, can I do it? Yeah, so 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And there we go, yeah. and then we can clip it off. Oh, yeah. that's interesting. Thank you.
Maggie, right? Library. Give me another thumbs up if you like watermelon. Raise the roof if you like pineapple. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Does anyone want to share their favorite fruit? Raise your hand. Apple. What do you got, bud? Apple. I love apples. What do you got? Bananas. Does anyone else want to share? Yeah. Grapes. Those are so yummy. What do you like? Really yummy. That's delicious. So for our fruit, this one's really challenging, okay? This one's going to use a lot of thinking power. Fruits, can we rub our tummies with one hand, and we're going to punch the sky, not your neighbor, with the other hand, okay? Looks like this. And then reverse it, go the other direction. And then go super fast.
Warm wishes from all of us at Parkview Health for a happy, healthy holiday season.
on tonight. So what are we doing right back here? So we're ambulance? just out here today showing the ambulance to anybody that comes to Dr. Day at Science Central. It's actually my first time being in an ambulance. Behind, I've never actually been in one. Oh really? Yeah. Okay. Any crazy stories? <laughs> Not, we really don't talk about it a whole lot. Just, you know, we try to keep things as confidential as we can for privacy reasons. Uh, that's understandable. Like, what all do you guys do in here? Like, for... We can do just about anything. We can uh, give all kinds of medications. We can monitor somebody's heart. We can perform yeah. CPR. We can do all kinds of airway stuff. It's, it's kind of limitless. There are some limits, but there's pretty much anything they can do in the ER, we can do in the ambulance. Everything short of surgery, pretty much. That's pretty much a hospital on wheels. Yep. Yeah. Kind of getting an eerie feeling in here. Mm -hmm. Eerie? Yeah. Hope not. All right, guys, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Hello all, this is Michelle. I'm a nurse here at Parkview Regional Medical Center in the emergency department. And this is my coworker, Christy, and my Hi friend. Um, we're gonna try and give you a look into the life of what it's like working in the emergency room during these crazy times of COVID. We'll first be greeted by one of our friends here. Hi, my name is Brooke. So my role is to screen everybody here that comes into the ER. Um, I'm placing a mask on everybody that comes in just to, for the safety of our healthcare workers and you. So this is the hallway. We send all our patients down alone. But it is for the good of, of the family members to be able to take care of anybody. Here's our lovely triage nurse, Christina. Hi. So I am the triage nurse. I have patients come back here after they've been to our main entrance and I screen them for any symptoms of the coronavirus. If we find that they have any symptoms or possible symptoms, then we make sure that they're put in the proper isolation and send them back um, so that they can get treatment pretty quickly. This is where they have to screen people. We now have plastic over yeah. everything in order to be able to protect all our folks' registrations over here. I'm Bethany, I'm with registration here at Parkview Regional Medical Center in the emergency department. Um, our workflow has definitely changed a lot. We used to be able to go into the patient's room and physically have a conversation with them and verify their information, any insurance questions, anything like that. Now it's all over the phone, no longer going into the rooms to really cut down the exposure. So it's definitely been a task, but we're getting it done as best we can. I feel pretty safe. I know that everyone we work with is definitely taking the proper precautions. Um, my name is Candace, and this is Megan. We're patient care techs here in the emergency room. We have to wear masks every day. Um, we've been wearing head caps to help keep us clean. Um, as far as like cleaning rooms, that changes a lot. Um, you know, if we have a potential exposure in a room, we have to shut that room down for two hours, let it sit, um, and then we have to call EBS, and they bring up UV lights. They um, do a whole disinfectant of the room. Um, and then we kind of have to gown up, love up, mask up, go in there and do a whole nother sweeping clean of the room before it can be uh, made available to other patients. It's been a challenge, but it's something we definitely have tolerated very well and are doing well doing. We have been loving the folks that have been loving on us during this time. Um, we appreciate all the signs and all the, the food that they've been sending us our way, um, keeping our spirits high, it makes it a lot more bearable. My name is Dr. Tyler Johnson. I'm an emergency physician here at Parkview Health in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We've had a lot of dynamic changes. We're seeing a lot of patients with COVID-19, but regular patients too. Um, really where and how we see patients has changed. We try to uh, put patients in certain areas that don't have it and then try to keep people that have it separated. We prepare for these things so we kind of understand what's going on. Our families definitely fear these kind of things, uh, bringing it home or visiting other families and things like that with all the restrictions. Um, some people are living away from their families and separate housing and those kind of things, apartments or, or vacation places and things like that, trying to limit the exposure since we are in it every day, all the time. Really, we're just trying to take care of patients and keep things going and um, we're open for business and seeing patients that need to be here and we just encourage people that if they do have a health concern or would normally come for an emergency that they come to the emergency department. 
Hi, I'm Angela. I'm a nurse here in the ER. We're taking a lot of precautions. I have this respirator mask. Most of us here in the ER do. We take it seriously. Um, we don't want to be guilty of hurting people. But to be honest, I'm a lot more afraid of people not coming in. I don't want to see people ignoring stroke symptoms or heart attack symptoms that have long-term consequences. Just try not to panic. Everything will be okay. We're here. We want you to come in. Um, don't wait for medical care. Hi, I'm Alethea. I'm James. We have created these new roles um, to help with COVID and I'm the COVID partner today. I'm the runner. So basically our goal is to have one person that gowns up and goes into the room, one nurse. Um, that way we're not using as much PPE, we aren't exposing as many people. So as a partner, I am the nurse out here that is running to go get medications, running to get blood cultures and lactic tubes and things like that. Anything that the nurse doesn't have in the room, I can bring to her so that we can lessen the exposure. So another way that we are helping um, lessen our exposure with COVID is we have these baby monitors that we've brought in and one goes into the room and the other one stays out here. That way the nurse that's out here helping um, can chart, we can know what the patient needs and what the nurse needs in there. Um, the nurse can just tell us through this baby monitor instead of opening the doors and all that type of stuff, we're able to communicate through these monitors. Hi, I'm Helen. I'm one of the nurse leaders here in the emergency room. My role has probably changed the most by trying to protect my staff members here in the department and doing things a lot differently than we're used to. Okay, so I'm getting a medic run soon and we think that it could be a COVID positive patient, so I'm just preparing myself to go into the room. So first I'm gonna put on my paper hood, um, and so I have to put the belt on first, and then I'll put the hood on next, and I have to turn it on. And then I'll have my spotter here who's gonna help me make sure that I have all my stuff prepared. And I'm going to put the gown on here. And then she's gonna help me tie the gown. And then I'll grab some clothes and put those on. And then I'm ready to care for my patient. Hi, I'm Jessica. I'm with the X-ray department at Parkview Regional Medical Center. Um, for my everyday role, we now have to um, gown up with a mask and goggles and a hairnet. Um, we are also taking extra precautions and um, sanitizing the entire machine down in between every single patient, making sure that um, everything is clean before we move on to the next patient. I'm Mindy Kurtz. I'm the director of the Allen County Emergency Departments. The emergency department, of course, is the first line of defense our facility has. So we were encountering COVID patients before we even really recognized it. So I think it was very important for us to um, to be implementing our PPE and all those precautions before the hospital even was ready to take those actions or even knew that we had um, some of those concerns in our community. We think a lot about keeping our patients safe and we wanted to continue that, but we also really wanted to make sure our staff always felt safe. They had what they needed to be able to provide safe care because that was very, very important to them and thus to us. I'm Audrey Honeycutt, the Nursing Services Manager of PRMC's ER. Our community has been amazing and supportive. It truly makes you realize why you do this job, why we're open, why any of us ever chose to work in the emergency department was to take care of our community. Well, the midnight headlights blind you on a rainy night. Steep grade up ahead, slow me down, making no time. But I gotta keep rolling. The windshield wiper, slapping out a tempo, keeping perfect rhythm with the song on the radio. 
Dr. Kate Wyatt, as I'm getting used to, and I'm a first year internal medicine resident here at Parkview. I'm actually originally from the West Coast, the Pacific Northwest, a little town called Yakima, Washington. I got lucky enough to get accepted to a medical school in my hometown. Medical school, you learn kind of like the base general knowledge. And now being in my residency, I'm just learning everything I wanted to learn. So across the nation, internal medicine residency is three years total. Typically what it's going to look like is you'll have residents, senior residents, and then attendings who are people that have completed their residency and they are specialists in their field. We'll do rounds together where we see patients. Ultimately, they're in charge of patient safety, making sure orders are in, and then our education, making sure that we're learning, putting in everything appropriately, and kind of progressing in our knowledge base. Parkview Internal Medicine Residency actually does what's called a four plus one, meaning we'll do four weeks of a rotation, like we'll do four weeks of wards. Wards is what we do most, especially during our first year of residency. And that's when the ER, the emergency department calls and says, we have a patient that's not safe enough to go home, they're sick enough to be admitted. We will go down and admit them and take care of them until they're safe to go home. And then every fifth week, no matter what rotation you did, you're in clinic. As a resident, it's just one-on-one, -on -one, me and the patient. We'll talk together, we come up with the plan, and then I'll go out, confirm with my attending, talk with the attending, and then either all of us or just me will go in and talk with the patient. And that for me is really special because then you really get to feel what it's like to be their doctor. We are all really happy to be here and we all are excited to learn. We are so grateful for our patients for allowing us to take care of them and then being a part of our educational journey. I have a great group of people around me that I enjoy being around that make going to work really fun. We have the support staff. We are supported. If we don't know something, go and find it. There's a person there that helps us. So just because we're learning doesn't mean you're not gonna get top quality care. So what happens after residency depends on what each internist or each 
third year resident decides they want to do. Some of my co-residents want to continue on and subspecialize further, such as cardiology, GI, or pulmonology, and that's an extra three years just about on top of internal medicine residency called a fellowship. Myself personally, I really like hospitalist medicine, and so I'll be able to practice that after my three years. I am uh, Jeff Linders, co-host for Wesley TV. Subscribe to Wesley TV. If not, the whole crew is going to come to your house and looking for you. Just kidding. Subscribe. You'll see lots of fun. Lots of trips. Lots of fan-friendly uh, fan fan fr stuff. See, I'm so hypnotized. Subscribe now. guess for what it is? Do you have an idea? No. This is your spinal cord. So it connects all the way back here and then goes all the way down your back and lets your brain talk to the rest of your body. Mm -hmm. So that's what all of these little fibers pop on. Hello. 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 I'm going to try this if I can get a fit. Um, it actually has a larger Oh. Oh. Actually, it's a box underneath this one. We have some oh, okay. Gloves. Okay. I was like, <laughs> Sorry, I would have touched it myself. No, you, no, I. So, you ready to record this? I mean, whoa. Well, when... oh, okay. We're doing a TV show. I'm trying to... I love that. The goal is for me to get my hands in these things first. If not, I'll just do it half and half. <laughs> so, we have to see what's going on inside my. Well, that's not really my brain. I'll do it this way. We wonder what's going on in my brain all the time. Well, here it is. <laughs> Ooh, you want to taste? Mm -hmm. This is a spinal cord. It is. It's a little bit odd, huh? Yes. Yeah, it's, 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 it's I can't touch it. Know some more. Isn't it insane? Thank you guys.
ďakujem vám veľa. Hi, my name is Michelle. I work in the emergency department at PRMC. I'm going to talk to you today about how to care for a minor burn. A minor burn, it involves the, the top layer of the skin, and that can be caused from cooking, from a hot surface. It can be caused from steam and also sunburn. The first thing you want to do is to remove the source of the burn. So if you have clothing that is touching or covering the burn, you want to remove that clothing. If the clothing sticks to the burn, you definitely just want to leave it in place. The next thing you want to do is remove any jewelry that may be down away from the burn or anywhere near it because the swelling is going to make that nearly impossible later on. And then you want to get to a source of cool running water. Put it under that water for a good 10 minutes. What you don't want to do is you don't want to use ice or ice water. That can actually freeze the area around and can actually worsen the burn. Um, if you're like camping and you don't have a running source of water and you have a cooler that has ice water in it, you can dip a rag, preferably a clean rag, into that and, and use that to cover and just keep replacing just to make sure that you are um, cooling that, that area and stopping that burn. Once you're done running that under the water for the 10 minutes, uh, you want to clean it with soap and water just to remove anything that might be in that area that can cause infection. If the skin were to blister, do not pop the blister because that blister is actually protecting that skin underneath and you want to be able to leave that in place so bacteria can't get in and cause infection. If it does blister, then you want to make sure to clean it with a mild soap and water, put antibacterial ointment over it and cover it with a sterile dressing and you want to change and do that daily. So if the skin is intact, you can use like an aloe gel or a hydrating lotion and just use as needed to try and keep that skin from drying out. You could use it several times a day. So if it blisters and you don't pop it, but it pops on its own, you can put some antibacterial ointment, place it on your sterile nonstick pad, place it over it, and then you can just cover it with like a Curlex and just put a loose covering over it. And when you go to tape this on, make sure not to tape over any of the burned areas. You wanna make sure to cover the, the whole area with the Curlex. Once the burn starts to heal, if it becomes red again and starts having streaks up the arm, or if it gets really tender, if there's any kind of uh, cloudy type discharge coming from it, or if you're running a fever, you definitely need to see a doctor for that. So it's getting to be that time of year again when people are out more and they're having bonfires and they're doing fireworks and they're starting up their grills and some of those can lead to these more severe burns. When that happens, if there's clothing on, you wanna try and get that off as soon as possible. You wanna start cooling that area. If the clothing is stuck to the burn, don't remove it. Just get into the emergency department with that. It started to blister right away and it's peeling off and it's greater than the size of my hand. So that means it's more than 1% of the body and that is a trip to the emergency department. So the important thing to remember when you have a minor burn is to get it under cool running water for at least 10 minutes. And if it involves the face, hand, feet, or genitalia, you need to be seen. And if it's deep and open, or if the skin sloughs off immediately, you need to get right into the emergency department. I'm Joe. I'm a certified child passenger safety technician. I work here at Parkview. Today, Ben and I are going to show you how to install a rear facing car seat using a seat belt. There's a belt path for the seat belt. You just need to locate that and put the seat belt through. Anytime you're using seat belts, child safety latches, anything like that, you're going to hear an audible click when you get it together. 
In this vehicle, we need to lock the seatbelt. So we're gonna pull it all the way out and let it ratchet back in. You also wanna make sure that the seat back is not touching the back of the seat in front of it. And we want to grab it at the belt path and make sure it doesn't move more than an inch. As you see, it has a five point harness. Buckle it from the bottom to the top. This goes at the armpit level. Then we want to tighten to make sure it's tight enough. As you can see here, I can pinch up some. That's too much. So I need to not be able to pinch up any. We have such a good cooperative boy here. So you want to pinch both at the, at the hips and at the shoulders. And this should lie in a flat, straight line and it should not pull his body out of proportion. Keep him in safe and snug. I'm Jo, I'm a certified child passenger safety technician. I work here at Parkview. Today, Luke and I are gonna show you how to install a forward-facing five-point harness child seat. To install a forward-facing seat, you wanna put it up so that it is against the back of this, the vehicle seat. We're gonna use the latch system today. Lower anchor is right there in the seat bite. And it simply clips in place on both sides. Then it needs to be tightened. So the movement is less than an inch from side to side to front to back. And usually these are easiest to tighten if you follow the belt path. Instead of pulling out, you wanna pull the direction the belt goes. When forward facing, you always wanna use the top tether. If the child's age and weight is appropriate, it comes through the back of the seat and then it latches onto a tether connector that's at the bottom of the seat in the back. Then you want to just tighten the seat. It doesn't have to be very tight, but you just want it snug. Once again, anytime you're working with car seats or seat belts, you'll hear a click when the two parts go together. There you go. This goes at armpit level, and we want to make sure that the harness comes from at or above his shoulders. Then we want to tighten to make sure it's tight enough. You want to pinch both at the shoulders and at the hips. So now Luke is safe in the car seat. So what do, you, what do you guys got going on over here? So we've got uh, our baby doll clinic and we've got some ice safety and uh, outdoor safety for the winter time. So the 
kids are coming through and giving our dolls a checkup. Sometimes they're giving them some shots and some medicine. Um, and it's helping them get a little bit more comfortable with uh, going to the doctor themselves and uh, getting uh, medical care and, and just being able to do some medical play so that they can have a better understanding. That's pretty cool. Because you get to have their hands on experience too. Yeah. yeah. When a child gets admitted to the hospital, they will most likely stay overnight in either our pediatric unit or pediatric intensive care unit. Both our pediatric units are locked units and everyone that wants to enter the unit must check in with the front desks. Every room is private, meaning only your child will be in that room and includes a bathroom with a shower. The rooms all have a sofa that pulls out into a bed and a television. Sometimes an admission is last minute and unexpected. Therefore, the units typically have most things a child and their family may need for this day. However, you are allowed to bring items with you. If a child has pajama pants and or a button-down pajama shirt, they are welcome to wear that. Otherwise, we will give them a gown to wear. We recommend and encourage parents to bring comfort items like stuffed animals, blankets, and other favorite items from home for their child. This can make the hospital environment less scary for them. One of our primary goals is to try and make the hospital environment and experience as normal as possible for our patients. And having familiar items around certainly helps us achieve this objective. Patients who are able to leave their room are welcome to go to the playroom to play. If your child can't leave their room, we can typically make arrangements to have toys taken to them. Sometimes, if approved by the child's doctor, the child may be able to go to our pediatric unit to enjoy the playroom. Our family lounge is a popular area for older patients, siblings, and families. It's a quiet room with vending machines and furniture. Families and siblings can often be found hanging out here, playing games, socializing, making phone calls, or just relaxing. While we typically ask that only one parent stay overnight with the child, Family visits are encouraged during the day. We do always ask families to be respectful of our other patients by following the hospital visiting hours and using quiet, calm voices in our units. All of this is designed to make your child's hospital stay as restorative and healing as possible. My name is Mike Oberg, I'm a paramedic and training officer for Parkview EMS and today I'm going to teach you how to do a simple exam that you can do for a stroke called a FAST exam. And that FAST exam stands for F is facial drooping, A is arm drift, S is slurred speech or inability to talk, and T is the importance of time to get her to the hospital quickly. Lynn, it looks like you may be having a stroke. Can you smile for me? Okay, good. Take my hands, hold your arms out. Okay, can you say the sky is blue? Lynn, I think you might be having a stroke, so I'm going to call 911 and get you to the hospital quickly. Other things to look for includes numbness or weakness of the leg, confusion or trouble understanding, trouble seeing in one or both eyes, trouble walking, dizziness or balance, and also an unexplained severe headache.
Yeah. 